Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This psalm has impacted my life because oftentimes I feel uncared for and alone. My favorite thing about this psalm is uh, the psalmist, he just looks up to the sky and he can see the work of God over all of creation. And he says, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? It's a great reminder that no matter what faces me, I'm cared for, and that I'm always on God's mind, and that I'm not alone. The young man is Landon Budkey. He is one of our ministry assistants here at the church and is also in our residency program. The psalm that, that Landon referenced, Psalm 8, man, it is a gem. It is an absolute gem. It's a little different than the psalms that we have seen uh, so far up to this point. This psalm that has impacted Landon so, uh, so profoundly, David is not in danger in this psalm. David is not running from an enemy. David's not hiding in a cave. He's not drowning in guilt over his sin. He's not betrayed by a friend. He's not longing to be in the house of the Lord. If anything, David is lost in this psalm. He's lost in his thoughts. He's lost in the awesomeness, the greatness, the majesty of God. We can almost get in our mind a picture of, of David at some stage in his life laying out in a meadow or a field at night looking up at the stars, contemplating, considering. I believe that this, this uh, literature that David turned into a song to be sung, I believe it is probably a part of David's own prayer journal as he contemplated and meditated on the greatness of God. The theme of this Psalm is the greatness of God. It begins, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And it ends with the same refrain. It starts with God's majesty and it ends with God's majesty. And I want us to look at only two points this morning in this psalm. Consider what he says in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Think about that first part of verse 1 for just a moment, about the greatness of God. He is saying, God, you are greater than all things. How do I know that? Because David is using this literary style that is so common in the Psalms, so common in Jewish literature, so common in Jewish thought. David would lay and look up at the highest possible thing that he could see. And in his mind, height represented majesty. Height represented greatness. So David, if we could imagine laying out in this field or this meadow or this pasture, maybe as a young child at night watching the sheep, I don't know, but looking up at the stars, the furthest possible point he could see. And what he's saying is, God, you are even greater than that. God, you are greater than I can imagine. You're greater than I can fathom. Your majesty is much more than my mind has the ability to take in. And I know that when we read this, O oh Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name in all the earth. You and I know that God truly is, I would say most all of us, if not all of us, come into this place convinced that God is truly greater than all things. But there is a difference between hearing that or knowing that and actually living in the reality that God is greater than all things. Because when I consider and believe and lean myself on that truth that God is more majestic and greater, and I'm going to kill some English people in here, is gooder than anything I possibly can imagine, what does that tell me? If God is over all things, then that means everything else is below Him. He is the most valuable. He is the most precious. And that is living life in light of that. If God is greater than all things, that means He's greater than me. 
That means the things of God are greater than the things of me. That means that, 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 his, that he is greater than my fears or my enemies or, or my concerns. That there's nothing that God is not over and above. He says, God, your height, the, the height of your majesty is over all the earth. Let me tell you something great about Josh and Megan. I love that they make this point in their, in their, in their, their uh, testimony about being called to missions. I love that they made it really clear that they're not taking God there. That God's already there. They're not making God's glory. They're going to Guatemala to uncover the glory of God that's already there. They're partnering with a God that is already at work. I got an email this week from the International Mission Board. Before you think I'm something special, it was a bulk email. It may have said Jamie, but I assure you, it was a bulk email. You know what it told me? It told me that there are still 3,000 unreached people groups by their research. 3,000 unreached people groups with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're formulating a plan now to, to get people in there to understand and to reach those unreached people groups. 3,000 unreached people groups. And even though we may look at that and say we need people to take God there, no, we don't. God is already working there. We're going to be able to send people there to uncover the glory and the greatness of God. But allow your mind for a moment to just consider what David is saying. God, you're greater than anything I can possibly imagine. You are better than, you are holier than, you are more powerful than, you are more majestic and more valuable than any other thing in the world. Now, when you and I are gripped by that reality that God is greater than all things, there is a natural response that comes from that as a follower of Christ. When I lift up and exalt Christ, I begin to see myself differently. You may remember the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 6 of his book, he actually communicates his own call into ministry. And he was in the temple one day serving, and, and he saw this vision of the Lord high and lifted up. And you may recall that God had communicated uh, through the, that there was a, a seraphim, and, and they were flying back and forth, and they were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you may remember that in, in, in Isaiah's testimony, he said that God said, who shall I send and who will go for us? And you may remember that Isaiah said, here am I, send me. But before Isaiah ever found himself in a position to surrender his life to the call and the cause of God, first, before that, he said, woe is me, for I'm undone, meaning I'm about to be destroyed. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah could not behold this image of God high and lifted up as great as he was and not see himself differently. Because he saw who God is, he saw himself more clearly. Yes, point number one, God is greater than all things. And then comes verse two. A peculiar verse almost seems out of place. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. That's a weird verse. He's talking about the majesty and the greatness of God being higher than the heavens and all of these things. And now he's talking about babies? What in the world is King David trying to communicate here? I believe what David is saying is, God, you have some unlikely worshipers. For being so great and so magnificent, you would think that it would be kings and rulers that David would speak of. But no, David is speaking about babies and infants that give him praise. Unlikely worshipers for this amazingly majestic God. Let me show you how this plays out. How Scripture shows us this actual event taking place. You'll notice probably in the margin of your Bible at Psalm 8 verse 2, there's a cross reference to Matthew chapter 21. If you were to follow Matthew chapter 21 to that account that it gives you, you're going to find a story where this actually plays out. We get to see what David actually meant hundreds of years after it was spoken. It says in chapter 21 verse 12 of Matthew, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He's causing a disruption. He's driving out the commerce and the marketing of God's house, and he's returning it back to a house of prayer for all nations. 
Jesus quotes Scripture. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of thieves. He's now identifying people. It's the religious leaders. You make it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful thing that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus answered, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In the midst of him overturning temple tables and restoring the Lord's house to a place of prayer, in the midst of that making enemies, the enemies are indignant that children are recognizing him as Savior. They are absolutely indignant, fiery, hot, angry, the fact that children are saying Hosanna to the Son of David, ascribing him the kingship of David. They're indignant. And they say to Jesus, do you not realize what they're saying? Jesus says, yes, I realize what they're saying. Do you not know your Bibles? Jesus defends himself by the praise of the children. Unlikely worshipers. Aren't you glad that this majestic, incredible God uses unlikely people for his purpose? Aren't you glad about that? That he calls out not the, the strong and the wise, and the rich, but the fools, calls them out for His glory and His purpose. They were not just unlikely worshipers, but there was unwarranted favor. Here is the crux of the psalm. Everything before this seems to build to it, and everything after it seems to build on it. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place... What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? When I consider the stars, the moon, the sun, think about what David is saying. God, I look up at the sky and I see these heavenly bodies that you've placed up there, and I see their beauty. I see the order and the structure. How not one time does the moon move from the path designated for it. Not one time does the star not cease to shine when and where it was appointed to shine. You know, David in his age had absolutely no way of holding the beauty of God's creation that you and I can today. When David looked up at the stars, he saw faint lights. When he saw the moon, he saw a white circle. And when he saw the sun, he saw a bright, shining ball. He had no way of being able to look at the vastness of created space the way we can today. He's never been able to see even a horse head nebula. Austin's going to show you a picture of one of the most viewed images ever from our modern satellites and telescopes. The Horsehead Nebula, 1,500 light years away. David had no way of seeing that. And yet, based off of what our naked eye sees, he says, God, you are greater than anything I've ever seen. Your stars, your heavenly bodies, they move exactly according to the destination that you place them on. Then he mentions angels. If you notice, he says in verse 5, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. When people encountered angels in their majesty in the Scriptures, do you know what they did? Two things. They either fell down as dead men or worshipped. The angels that God used invoked fear because of how glorious they were. And David says, God, I don't understand this. You've made this beautiful sky. And all of those bodies go all on their ordained path, and they run perfectly in order with the way you designed. 
and the angels in all of their glory, and you made us just a little lower than the angels. Angels always obey God. When God says to go and to say, they go and they say, and I know you're going to say that there are some that didn't. They disobeyed, and you're right. They rebelled. But you know what happened to those angels that rebelled? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says, They have been reserved unto chains unto everlasting darkness. Think about this with me for a minute. God, this sky is beautiful. It runs in order. Everything does what it's supposed to do. Angels are perfectly obedient. It doesn't matter if they carry the message of the newborn king or sweep a street. They're going to bust their hump to be there. And the ones that did rebel, they never got a chance at grace, ever. That blows my mind. The angels that sinned or rebelled are reserved unto chains, unto everlasting darkness. Second Peter 2, 4, it's right there. They never had an opportunity to repent. They have never, nor will they ever be, recipients of God's grace. It is remarkable to me. No wonder the angels of God rejoice more over one sinner that repents more than 99 just persons that need no repentance. No wonder they rejoice. Grace is an amazing thing to them because they can't receive it. And here in all of their glory, in all of their splendor, in all of their obedience, in all of their majesty, God still has not shown them grace. But He bestows it extravagantly on me and you. You see, this is the natural path. The more I consider the greatness and the magnificence of God, the more humble it's going to make me. God, all the creation is beautiful and it runs in order and you got the angels that always do what they're supposed to do and the ones that didn't, they never got an opportunity of grace and yet here am I. God, morally, I'm not beautiful. Morally, I'm reprehensible in light of your holiness. God, I don't run in order. I mess up. I fail. God, I don't always do what you tell me to do when you tell me to do it and even if I do, I often don't do it right. And yet you've never reserved me unto chains and everlasting darkness. If anything, as a Christian, you've reserved me in your love. No wonder those angels look at the gospel. David describes what God has given. He says in verse 4 that you care for him. Why would God care for us? Why would you make us a little lower than the angels? Why would you crown us with glory and honor? Why would you give us dominion over the work of your hands? Why? There may have come time in your life where something happened that you didn't want to happen and it hurt you. Maybe something didn't happen that you wanted to happen and it hurt you. And as a follower of God, you may have had questions. God, why did you do that thing? Or God, why did you not allow that thing to happen? And as a follower of Christ, for the most part, you probably recognize that it was God's decision. And that's where you're wrestling. But before I become angry at God's sovereign decisions over my life, I have to remember it was His same sovereign decision to show me favor. You see, not one of us compelled God to do what He did. Not one of us earned anything that he gave us. Not one of us was worthy of the grace that has been lavished on us. Not one of us was worthy to be cared for, to be made, to be crowned, to be given. Not one of us. So when I start to get angry at God's sovereign decision, 
I need to remember it was that same sovereignty that said, I choose to love them. I choose to send the best of heaven for the worst of the world. I choose to make a plan to save them, though they not call for it, though they're not begging for it, though they don't even realize the depth of their depravity and their destruction that is imminent. None of us were calling God, did it? He initiated that relationship. And I think that the key is when I look at your heavens. You and I spend so much time focused on things that may not matter, that could we focus our attention on things that really do drive us to the foot of the cross? Can we walk out of here today and look at this world and say, God, you are amazing. God, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. But it doesn't have to make sense for me to believe it. That you have shown me great grace and great love. Though I don't always run the right course, though I don't always obey, Thankfully, as a follower of Christ, you've never reserved me unto chains and everlasting darkness. Rather, you said that no man shall be able to pluck me out of your hand. And I'm going to ask you this morning, if you have never trusted Christ, I don't know, I don't know another verse, honestly. I don't know another verse outside of maybe a scene from Calvary that would remind me of the depth of God's grace for me. There is no greater span than the span of God's goodness in my unworthiness. And we call that span grace. And today, not because of who you are, not because of what you've done, God chose to love you. He created you. He made you. He cares for you. He's given you. And if you've never trusted Christ, I don't know another. You're going to have to trample on the grace of Christ to get out of here this morning. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? We're going to have a decision time. Whatever that next step for you is, maybe today you want to know this God who loves you and cares for you. You want to enter into that relationship with him this morning. I'm going to invite you to come. I'm going to have counselors all along the front. You can take care of that business with God this morning. Maybe it's a rededication. Maybe it's like Carter. It's a baptism or church membership. Father, this morning, help us to not just hear these words, but to believe these words, to lean our entire life on them to do our best to run the parameters of your love, knowing that we'll never in this flesh be able to understand it or exhaust it. Let us enjoy it. Let us steward the love of God well. Father, let us this morning lift praise to you for spanning that great gulf between your goodness and our unworthiness with grace. Thank you this morning for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and being raised the third day that we may have eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us for service this morning. If you made any decisions or would like to talk to someone, please contact the church office. We look forward to meeting you in person.